It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, and my, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier about the ongoing uh, RCMP investigation into his government, but we didn't get much of a response. Uh, the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing did say uh, that the government would assist the RCMP, the Information and Privacy Commissioner, the Integrity Commissioner in their multiple investigations of this government. If the Premier has nothing to hide and wants to assist the Privacy Commissioner, then why is he sending government lawyers to block the disclosure of information about government business that's being conducted on his personal phone? And to reply, the Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, of course, the Premier uh, follows all of the rules as set out by this House uh, with respect to uh, and, uh, and set up by the government with respect to use of, uh, of phones and all other things, so, Mr. Speaker. But look, at the same time, uh, uh, later on today, uh, Speaker, we will have an opportunity to vote on the fall economic statement. It is a statement that will uh, help uh, refocus, uh, continue to refocus us on cutting taxes for people, ensuring that uh, the people of the province of Ontario have more homes built uh, for them. I hope the Leader of the Opposition uh, will give some thoughts to supporting us because there are some very valuable pieces within that legislation that will continue to move the province forward, ensure affordability for the people of the province of Ontario. I think that is what uh, uh, the people of this province are are focused on, Speaker. I, th I think uh, they're a little less focused on uh, on the Premier's uh, cell, phone, uh, cell phone use. As you know, uh, uh, she and all people of the province of Ontario can call the Premier anytime they like. He has put his number out there and uh, encourage her to do that if she needs some advice on the, uh, on the voting after the... The supplementary question. Speaker, well, maybe I need to maybe I need to call the premier's personal cell phone to finally get an answer. Uh, yesterday, the Toronto Star quoted anonymous Order. government staffers who said the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and his former Chief of Staff were not the real masterminds behind the sketchy 8.3 billion dollar greenbelt grab. They said, "quote Everyone knows they were doing what they were told." Yes. So, to the Premier, was it the Premier who told them what to do? Speaker, I mean, honestly, look, uh, the Integrity Commissioner already spoke about that. Uh, uh, and as I've said, we made a public policy decision which was based on building more homes for the people of the province of Ontario, full stop. That decision was not supported by the people of the province of Ontario because the process did not meet their expectations. But let there be no doubt, Madam, Mr. Speaker, that we will continue to move forward with building homes for the people of the province of Ontario. This isn't about who calls the Premier. This isn't about uh, the Green Belt. This is Order. about long-standing NDP ideology against building homes. Because if it was any differently, they wouldn't have nominated a, a, a candidate in Kitchener Order. who is literally voted against every single housing development in the community, Mr. Speaker. She Order. went as far as to say she couldn't support thousands of affordable homes being built Response. because it was too close to a pickleball court, Mr. Speaker. That is the ideology of the NDP. That's what this is all about, and we won't stand for it. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, uh, I really hope that the Premier will answer this time. I'm going to go back to the Premier. Uh, this government gave preferential treatment to insider greenbelt speculators, enriching them to the tune of $8.3 billion at the public's expense without building a single new home. It included the Duffins Rouge farmland that was supposed to be protected. Speaker, The Conservatives' scheme undid those protections and made their insider friends $6.6 .6 billion richer. Billion. The government's already three ministers down. So to the Premier, how many ministers will have to take the fall before he fesses up? That's right. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Now, that is absolutely, positively incorrect, right? That is completely incorrect, but facts don't usually matter for the NDP. But let me tell you a fact that does matter. Let me tell you a fact that does matter. 
in Kitchener, where they had an opportunity, Order. where the councillor who they now elected to be their candidate in Kitchener had Order. an opportunity to vote to improve and build 1,100 units in downtown. The NDP candidate said no. When it was a 10-story, 132-unit condo development, the NDP candidate said no. When it was a 532 residential unit development, the NDP candidate said no. $600,000 to build affordable homes, the NDP candidate said no. 238 units for downtown, the NDP candidate said no. 211 Response. units for downtown, the NDP candidate said no. She said yes to pickleball, no to thousands of people living in Kitchener. That's their star candidate, and that's why the people don't trust them. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members, please take their seat. Order. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. The members opposite are looking pretty uncomfortable these days. They're probably wondering, they're probably wondering who Order. this premier Order. is going to throw under the bus next. Yeah. Speaker, uh, the question is for the premier. The people of Ontario, the they see a pattern of preferential treatment for this government. The former Minister of Health, who got the ball rolling so that private companies could profit off of our public health care services, is now a lobbyist for the largest chain of private surgical centres anywhere in the country. A clinic she actually represents is now receiving more funding to provide the same services that are delivered in public hospitals. And that's exactly what we have been warning was going to happen. So to the Premier, why is the province paying private for-profit clinics as much as four times more than public hospitals for the same procedures? Members will please take their seats. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know, colleagues. You feel uncomfortable? No, I'm feeling pretty good today, Paul. I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. We're building homes in the province of Ontario. Long term care. We're building new hospitals for the people of the province of Ontario. We're building long term care for the people of Ontario. Now, I know that the, the candidate in Kitchener was against GO Train expansion because they were too noisy. They're too noisy and they start too early. They're too noisy and start too early. But I don't know, colleagues. I feel pretty comfortable, and I'm feeling even more comfortable. I'm feeling even more comfortable because we're going to pass a fall economic statement for the people of the province of Ontario later on today, and even more comfortable that because of this premier, the carbon tax has fallen off the table across the country, not just in Ontario. And you know who agrees with us? The NDP finally agree with us. It's I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This is a government that will say absolutely anything to avoid answering the questions of the people of Ontario. Yeah. That's the truth. A government, a government that is under criminal investigation by the RCMP. The former Minister of Health would have been responsible, Speaker, for transferring licenses for publicly funded surgical centers, surgical services to for-profit clinics. Under her watch, funding for one private-for-profit surgical center, Don Mills, has quadrupled since 2018, reaching 5.2 million by 2022-23. The same cataract surgery that costs $500 in a public hospital costs more than $1,200 at Don Mills. Whoa. So to the Premier, and I hope he will answer this question, how is hemorrhaging public funds innovative or cost-effective health care? Tell us. To reply, the Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, what the opposition isn't telling people, that there was 14,000 cataract surgeries <laughs> were off the list of backlogs that people can see, they can read the books to their grandchildren. That's what they aren't saying. They aren't saying 49,000 hours of MRI and CT CAT scans last year alone paid by OHIP, not their credit card. What, she, what the opposition isn't saying, how since we've been in office, 
We've hired and registered over 63,000 nurses, 8,000 doctors. Last year alone, 15,000 nurses came on board. We're spending over $50 billion Order. renovating or building new hospitals right across this province. But guess, guess what, Mr. Speaker? They voted against it. Yeah. They voted against more nurses, more doctors, Response. building more medical universities, building more hospitals. That's what they, they stand for. Final supplementary. Nurses, Speaker, nurses can't leave the public health system fast enough under this government's watch. 2.2 million Ontarians don't Order. have a family practitioner Order. in this province. Here's what's really going on. Clearpoint is a wholly owned company of Kensington Capital Partner Limited. That's a private equity firm. They're not healthcare experts or medical professionals. They're a for-profit corporation. Their priority is to maximize profits for their shareholders. These profits come from overbilling uh, patients, from charging unnecessary fees, from cutting costs by compromising quality. So back to the Premier. Why does this government keep prioritizing patient profits over, uh, sorry, private profits over patient care? Members will please take their seats. Reply, the member for Anglican Lawrence, Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Health. Thank you to the member for the question. I think the member had it right when she tripped over her wording there. We are prioritizing patients. We are prioritizing patient care. We are clearing the backlog brought about by COVID. We also have a lot more demand, and we are making sure that people have access to surgeries and scans and screens as quickly as possible, and that's what the people of Ontario want. The Don Mills Surgical Unit has been funded since 1960, with licenses renewed every two to five years under every stripe of, po of government, every political stripe. So the NDP renewed, the Liberals renewed, and the Conservatives have renewed the license for that centre, and they have been funded the same way on a procedure basis. We have also added premiums to clear the backlog brought about by COVID and to Response. get more surgeries done. We're going to continue to make sure Order. patients get care as quickly and efficiently as possible in whatever they Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. The Premier continues to break his government's promise to make municipalities whole for revenue losses due to Bill 23. There was no money to do this in the budget or the recent fall economic statement. The Building Faster Fund won't come close to replacing those lost revenues and is based on shovels in the ground, something municipalities have no control over. Municipalities control approvals, developers control shovels. The planning system is in chaos and municipal taxpayers are facing massive tax increases. When will the Premier stop bullying municipalities and finally adopt policies that will actually get more homes built, such as ending exclusionary zoning and investing in non-market housing? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing what the member opposite is talking about, because since this government has been in office, we have seen housing starts increase year after year after year, right? And we're not just seeing it at one level, we're seeing purpose-built housing also increase also to record nice. levels, right? You know why? Because of the policies of this Premier, this caucus, this government on both sides of the House, Speaker. We're not doing anything against our municipalities, we're working with them. We have said that the Building Faster Fund that was brought in, Mr. Speaker, it is about incentivizing those communities that could actually get shovels in the ground, Mr. Speaker. That is what the NDP like, right? They like permits, they like process, they like focus groups. But when it comes to actually delivering, they back off, just like Debbie Chapman in Kitchener. She'd love to give, she won't even give a permit for crying out loud. If it's up to Debbie Chapman in Kitchener, the thousands of homes, you know why Kitchener won't get BFF? Because Spons. people like Debbie Chapman, the NDP star candidate, won't allow shovels in the ground. Stop nominating people like that, and we'll get more shovels in the ground. But don't worry, we'll get it. The supplementary question. Speaker, this Premier ignored the vast majority of recommendations from his own Housing Affordability Task Force and instead wasted over a year on municipal power grabs and attacks on the Greenbelt and Ontario's farmland. 
Municipalities are fed up, not only because of the cost this Premier has dumped onto local taxpayers and the preferential treatment for his speculator friends, but also because all this chaos is making it harder for municipalities to get homes built. Will the Premier compensate municipalities for all revenue losses due to Bill 23 with funding based on housing targets they can actually control? Yes or no? Members will please take their seats. Recognize the Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, you know, they did a, a, a great uh, you know, our task force did a great job. We've implemented over 21 recommendations. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? They based it on 200,000 people. Just to inform the NDP, I don't know if they've seen it or not, over 800,000 people have arrived wow. in our province last year alone, the fastest growing region in North America, Order. bar none. But what they don't say is how we had the, uh, the most starts in 2021, 99,566, 2022, 96,000. And again, Mr. Speaker, we're pouring money into housing. The, the Building Faster Fund is $1.2 billion. I told my colleagues in the U.S. that they came up, the senators and congresspeople and governors, that we have to pay municipalities to build. They almost fell off their chair when I told them that. $1.2 billion, small, the smaller Response. rural areas, another $500 million. I can guarantee you one thing, Mr. Speaker, we're building that 1.5 million homes as they vote against every single piece of legislation we have. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The NDP and Liberal members in this House are standing by idly as the federal carbon tax continues to hurt businesses and drive up costs for households. Rather than picking up the phone and calling the Prime Minister and his right-hand man, Jagmeet Singh, to scrap the tax, they choose to turn their backs on their constituents. Unlike them, we will always stand up for the businesses and people of the province of Ontario. That's why, from day one, our government has opposed this terrible carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the federal carbon tax is affecting businesses in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much. You know, we were here till midnight last night, and I had an opportunity to speak about this very topic. And I'll tell you what we said last night: that when we travel around the world and talk to businesses, they ask you, "What the heck is this thing called a carbon tax? And how much is it going to cost my business?" And I can tell you, we have to fight for every single job that we bring here. 27 billion in new auto in the last three years. Three billion in new life sciences in the last year, tens of billions of new tech in the, life, in the last three years. Can you imagine if we did not have to sit there and explain this carbon tax, how much more business would be coming into Ontario? Because when they hear that number, that they have to pay a tax on their fuel, on their goods, on everything they wear, on everything they consume, they realize this Response. is becoming expensive and that is a deterrent to doing economic development in our province. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. As the Minister mentioned, the federal carbon tax is making everything more expensive. The Liberals and the NDP who still support this tax are out of touch with businesses and the hard-working people in this province. For them, the carbon tax is driving up costs across the board. Across the board. It has made it harder for people to heat their homes and harder for them to put food on the table. Businesses are facing skyrocketing energy costs thanks to the carbon tax. We hear these concerns day after day after day, and that's why we will not stop until this tax is scrapped. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the carbon tax is affecting businesses and families across the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, there, the Liberal government have never seen a tax that they don't love. We are here showing them an example. We have reduced the price of gasoline by 10 cents a litre, and they have increased 
taken the opposite approach. They've increased the price of gasoline by 15 cents a litre, on its way to 37 cents a litre. We have shown them lower taxes equals greater jobs in Ontario and across the country. We've lowered the cost of doing business by $8 billion. 700,000 men and women go to work today that didn't go to work five years ago, sure. Speaker. That's exactly what happens when you lower costs, when you lower taxes, when you lower the price of gas, you get the economy moving. But we have this brick wall that we hit as they increase the price of gas 15 cents, going to go to increase Spons. it to 37 cents. We need them to drop the carbon tax. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, two Toronto pharmacy declared publicly that they are no longer administering vaccine due to major problems with the province's new vaccine distributor. You know who that is, Speaker? Shoppers Drug Mart, Loblaw's chain of pharmacy. Those pharmacists reported receiving only 10% of their orders, having to cancel days of pre-booked appointments, a real headache. Does the Premier see a conflict of interest in having Shoppers Drug Mart responsible for distributing vaccine to their competitors? Member for Eglinton Lawrence, and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, the member opposite, for the question. We are using the Shoppers Drug Mart vaccine distribution system because it is the system that is everywhere in Ontario, making sure we get vaccines to people across the province in a timely way. This is the same system we've been using during COVID, uh, and it was very successful in getting vaccines everywhere. But it's always up to the pharmacy whether they want to opt in or opt out to providing those vaccines. Um, and you know, sometimes pharmacies also don't order the number of vaccines that they end up order. needing to deliver to their population. They can adjust what their order is and get more vaccines. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, complaints against shoppers' drug mart distribution of vaccine are coming from every part of the province. A pharmacist in Northern Ontario reached out to me. Last year, she was alone, so she only administered a limited number of vaccines. This year, she's able to recruit three new pharmacists to come and help her. She got vaccine clinic booked solid for weeks on end but no vaccine, as the distributor will only give her a percentage of what she used last year. Wow. Speaker, public health handle vaccine distribution in Ontario for decades with no issue. They knew, they listened to the local provider. They were reliable. Does the Premier understand that handing over the distribution of vaccine over to their friends at Loblaws is having a drastic consequence, drastic consequences on the health of Ontarians. The members will please take their seats. The Premier. Realize it's a new vaccine. And if I could go to the factory and get all the vaccines we could for everyone in North America, I'd do it. But it doesn't work that way. And the largest distributor in the Order. province and in the entire country are the 4,000 pharmacies which Shoppers Drug Mart has the best distribution center anywhere in the country. That's the reason during the pandemic Order. we involved the pharmacies and we set records around the world. We we're vaccinating over 100,000 people a day thanks to the great partners in the pharmacies. It's convenient care close to home. That's what it's all about. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. We've spent a lot of time talking about the carbon tax since the federal, federal Liberal government announced they would be exempting only a very small percentage of Canadians from the tax, leaving Ontario out in the cold. One of the consistent themes of this debate is that there are better ways to pursue climate targets without jeopardizing affordability for hardworking families and individuals. Unfortunately, the federal government seems unwilling to listen to the feedback from the provinces. Speaker, through you, can the minister please share his views regarding the negative impact that the carbon tax and other reckless energy policies are having on all Ontarians? Thank you. I, the Minister of Energy. 
Speaker, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, when the Ontario Liberal Party was in power here in Ontario, we saw them make so many mistakes on the energy file. Admittedly, uh, after the fact, they announced that, uh, yes, we were wrong in making so many of these choices, driving up the cost of electricity in the province and driving up the cost of fuel. And we're watching in real time as their federal counterparts, the federal Liberal Party under Justin Trudeau, are doing the exact same thing. First, with the carbon tax, we warned them that it, would gonna, it was going to drive up the cost of everything, Mr. Speaker, and the Bank of Canada now confirms that that is the fact. We're seeing inflation rise, and we're seeing the cost of everything rise, Mr. Speaker, and now we're worried that the next shoe to drop from the federal Liberal government is on the way. It's called the Clean Electricity Regulations, Mr. Speaker. It is going to make our electricity across not just Ontario, but across That's the country more expensive and less stable. And I look to uh, give you some more details on the clean electricity regulations. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, thank you to the minister for his answer. It is very concerning to hear from the minister about potentially more damaging energy regulations that are under consideration by the federal government. I know that my constituents in Carleton are already concerned about the negative impact that the carbon tax is having on their household budgets. The carbon tax is making their lives more unaffordable as it drives up the price of fuel, groceries and goods and services. They are also concerned to see that the federal government is only looking out for certain provinces and leaving others out in the cold. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the negative impact of additional energy regulations on Ontarians? Thank you. Thanks very much to the member from uh, Carleton. Federal Minister uh, Stephen Guibault has shared draft regulations that are rigid and they ignore the need for flexibility that's being asked for by provinces, territories and our electricity system operators based on their real-world experience. Here in Ontario, our independent electricity system operator, the ISO, has told my ministry that these draft regulations would slow the electrification of our economy by compromising the reliability and affordability of our electricity system here. And like with the carbon tax, the federal government is on the verge of making a costly and short-sighted mistake because they won't listen to their provincial counterparts, and more importantly, they won't listen to those who operate the systems. We hope that the federal government will work with us so that we can build a 100 per cent clean grid while supporting reliability Response. and protecting ratepayers. Mr. Speaker, if the federal government won't listen to those who operate our electricity systems, we're in for more big problems in our country and in our province. Okay. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. Recently, it was announced by government agency Metrolinx that staff must meet a monthly quota for fare evasion tickets. Evidence-based research points to the harm fare quotas have so long as systemic barriers remain in place that disproportionately impact people with disabilities, mental health challenges, low income, the unhoused, and BIPOC folks. Folks who experience more differential treatment, quote unquote, from authority due to outright discrimination and unconscious bias, quote unquote. For instance, Sam, a racialized constituent years back, was fined 240 bucks for fear evasion simply because their Presto car didn't work. A system malfunction. That's happened to me too, Speaker. She wasn't believed. And the question is, why? My question to the Premier. Why is this government implementing fear evasion quotas that may additionally harm communities, certain ones more than others, especially during an affordability crisis, instead of boosting revenue by properly funding transit to improve service and ridership? Thank you, Speaker. Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Affordability is the number one issue at the moment across the nation and in our province under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, we are making life more affordable, Mr. Speaker, by eliminating double fare, triple fare, and making it one fare, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this one fare program will save riders $1,600 every year per rider, Mr. Speaker. The great news is our government is fully funding this program, Mr. Speaker. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? The Liberals and NDP voted against this bill, against this one, not just once, Mr. Speaker. They have voted against twice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. These fair quarters are Metrolinx's. is, frankly, this government's ploy to fill funding gaps that they themselves are responsible for. Instead, they're penalizing riders, while Metrolinx has a $1 million man at its helm, 59 VPs, 19 C-suite executives. That's where you find the money to help folks in St. Paul's and across the province travel. This is also while Metrolinx Eglinton Crosstown is three years delayed, Speaker, and billions of dollars over budget. Many communities across Ontario, including mine, have been left stranded when it comes to transit infrastructure, and fixing that should be the priority of this government, not propping up discriminatory practices on the backs of folks who feel it the most. My question is back to the Premier if he'd actually answer his own questions. Will you put an end to problematic fare evasion quotas and put question. your focus on making sure Metrolinx finishes what they started so our communities can actually travel from point A to B? Thank you. Again, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, students, seniors, adults, they have asked for more affordability when it comes to transit. And that's exactly how our government is delivering under the leadership of Premier Ford, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the one fare program applies to GTHA, whether riders coming from Berry Transit, Brampton Transit, Burlington, Bradford West, Gillamsbury, Durham Region, Grand River, Gulf. Hamilton, Milton, Mississauga, Oakville, and York Region, all the transit riders, Mr. Speaker, starting early 2024, they will save $1,600. And Mr. Speaker, our government is fully funding that, and we are on track to deliver this, Mr. Speaker, and the people can use these $1,600 towards their family, towards their kids, and towards their future, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to build transit across GTHA. We'll continue to build a Northlander Spons? that liberals cancel, oh, and we will make oh. sure we'll bring Northlander by 2026. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Ontario is in the midst of an affordability crisis, and this government has had five years to act. Despite that, grocery prices are up. Hydro prices are up. Mortgage payments and rents are Order. up. Transit prices are up. After five years, after five years, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are asking themselves, are we better off? Now, Order. this government has the power to act. The Order. Premier has the power to act. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier support the elimination of the HST from home heating and get it done before Christmas? Get it done. Order. Order. The Premier can reply. Am I actually hearing this correctly coming from the Liberals, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, that actually bankrupt this province, yeah. closed 600 schools, fired thousands of nurses, built 600 uh, homes on long-term care when we're on our way to 30,000 in 15 years, Order. had the largest sub-sovereign debt in the entire world, highest hydro rates in the entire world, Ottawa, the nerve. Order. <coughs> what we're doing, we're doing the opposite. We've never raised a tax on the people of Ontario. We reduced taxes. We got rid of the license registration tax. We got rid of the tolls on the poor 12, 418. We reduced gas tax by 10.7 since, Mr. Speaker, and we gave a tax break to the lowest income people in Ontario, 1.1 million people. All they know how to do is raise taxes over and Spons. over again. We're cleaning up their mess of 15 years. Here, here. <laughs> Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Mer Thank you, Speaker. We are facing an affordability crisis in Ontario. The government has five years to improve the quality of life of Ontarians. However, there are still families left aside. The cost of grocery is more expensive. The cost of hydro is more expensive. Mortgage prices are more expensive. Even transit is more expensive. expensive. Five years later, Ontarians are wondering if their situation is getting better. The government has the power to act. Will the Premier support the elimination of the HST on home heating and will they apply 
all those changes before Christmas so they can help Ontarian families. You know what was more expensive? Under their administration for 15 years, ask the 300,000 people that lost their jobs under their administration. Then talk to the 700,000 people that can put food on their table now, that have great employment, and hundreds of thousands of more people will be employed by the end of our mandate. We've seen, we've seen businesses invest unprecedented amounts in Ontario more than anywhere in North America. We're actually leading North America in job creation, economic development. Mr. Speaker, just two months ago, we created more jobs in Ontario than all 50 states combined. That's what they need to do. They need to get on track and make sure that they cut the taxes, cut the carbon taxes, and start voting with us instead of against us, because you created the mess. Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member for Ottawa South to come to order and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to come to order. to start again. Let's start the clock. The member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. You know, the carbon tax hurts our economy and raises the price on everything, from filling up our cars to heating our homes in the winter. So putting a carbon tax that raises the price of gasoline hurts our businesses and negatively impacts our economy. It hurts our farmers entrepreneurs, businesses, families and individuals. So a month ago, the Bank of Canada reported that the federal carbon tax was responsible for a mere 0.15 per cent increase in inflation. But now the figures have changed. The governor uh, of the Bank of Canada now says that the correct impact of the carbon tax is actually four times higher. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this regressive tax creates economic hardship for all Ontarians. And to reply, the member for Oakville and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that great question. Our government knows that Ontarians are worried about making ends meet during these difficult times. We know that now is not the time for a punitive and costly tax that makes life more unaffordable for the people of Ontario and the people across this country. I'm, of course, referring to the federal carbon tax. Speaker, this tax is as the member pointed out, driving up inflation and making all areas of life more expensive. It is making it more expensive to drive to the store to get food for your family. And once you arrive, Speaker, it's making the food at that store more expensive. This is why our government continues to urge the federal government and do the right thing and eliminate this regressive carbon tax. I wish the members opposite would join us in requesting the federal government cancel this tax now. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you from the member from uh, Oakville, the parliamentary assistant, and the Minister of Finance for their dedicated work. Uh, speaker, the last thing the carbon, the last thing that Ontarians need is another tax. Unfortunately, the carbon tax is just that. So it's another tax that essentially drives up the prices of everything. And we know that the carbon tax is doing nothing more than making life more expensive for people in our province and across this country. So we need all members of this legislature to fight for Ontario's interest and call on the federal government to treat Ontario with respect when it comes to coming, providing an uh, exemption for the carbon tax. Speaker. Can the parliamentary assistant please elaborate on how the federal government's carbon pricing policy negatively impacts all Ontarians? Great question. Mr. Holtzell, parliamentary assistant, Minister of Finance. 
question from the member opposite, and the member is correct in saying this is a serious issue affecting all Ontarians and Canadians. And I agree, as you mentioned as well, about the Bank of Canada does not fully address the negative effects of this tax. Even the readjusted calculation by the Bank of Canada considered only the direct impact of the carbon tax on three specific products, gasoline, heating oil, and natural gas. The federal government is failing to recognize that the rising costs of consumer goods will quickly become unsustainable. Our government opposed the carbon tax from the start, and we will oppose this useless tax until it is finally removed. There are two approaches to take in this particular issue, Speaker. Either you cut taxes, like we've done with the gas tax, or you increase taxes, like the federal government has done. We ask the members opposite to pick a side. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, under this government's watch, we saw a public university go bankrupt, and now we have a new report highlighting the widespread financial fragility of the sector. The report has confirmed that this government provides the lowest per student funding in the country uh, for our colleges and universities. Compared to the rest of Canada, Ontario's per student funding is just 44 per cent for colleges college students and 57 per cent for university students. Speaker, will this government commit today to bringing Ontario's per-student funding in line with other Canadian provinces? To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. I am excited to say that after months of hard work, the Blue uh, Ribbon Panel report was released yesterday. And I want to thank the members of the panel for their diligent work and also thank Dr. Alan Harrison for his leadership. As we review the report and begin to develop and implement solutions for the future of the sector, know that our top priority is and has always been students. But we also know the value of an education in Ontario, which is why when a student enrolls at any of our colleges and universities, they know the education they will receive is strong and among the best in the world. Over the coming weeks, we will be focused on addressing the financial sustainability, institutional accountability, and how we as a collective can support our students today and into the future. My job is to ensure that post-secondary is sustainable for years to come so that young folks like this in the crowd today have post-secondary in the future. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, under this government, provincial grants now account for just 30 per cent of university operating revenues, which is failing students and putting the sector at serious risk. The University of Waterloo will end this year with a $15 million operating budget deficit. Queen's University has announced a deficit of $63 million. Wilfrid Laurier, $11 million. The University of Guelph has reported budget deficits for three consecutive years. Deficits mean program cuts and hiring freezes, hurting students and undermining the quality of university education. When will this government increase post-secondary education operating funding to prevent more universities from falling into deficit or even bankruptcy? Again, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the long-term financial sustainability of our post-secondary institutions is a top priority moving forward. But as I mentioned before, the sustainability and viability of our sector is a shared responsibility. I have been clear that institutions will also need to review their spending and operating practices for any increase in funding to be considered. When our government invests over $5 billion annually of taxpayer dollars in operating funds for our colleges and universities, we need to ensure that that money is being spent wisely. That doesn't account for the billions in tuition, including over a billion through OSAP, that students and their families spend, spend on education every year. So as we review the report, we will be sure to review all recommendations holistically to ensure the path forward reflects, reflects the collective respectively. Thank you. The next question, the member for Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. This government knows things that it won't tell the people of Ontario. They know that the vast majority of Ontario households are better off with a carbon price. Not only will it help, not only will it help keep our world. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock.
The government side will come to order so that I can hear the member who rightly and duly has the floor. Order. Restart the clock. Member for Canada Carleton. This government knows that the vast majority of Ontario households are actually better off with a car price on carbon. Not only, not only does it keep Order. our world habitable with the climate. I gather there's a difference of opinion in the House on the matter that's being raised, but the member has every right to ask the question without being drowned out by the government's side. If it persists, I'll start calling you out by name. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Restart the clock. Member for Kanata Carleton. They know that the vast majority of households in Ontario are better off with the price on carbon. Not only will it keep our order habitable, but with a climate action rebate, it actually means more money in their pockets. This government knows that 270,000 households in Ontario use heating oil and that they are eligible for the climate price exemption. This government knows that the oil and gas industries made record profits last year. 18 cents of additional profit on every litre of gas. The carbon price was two cents. This government knows that they have the power to do something rather than just point fingers. We put an amendment to Motion 70 forward to cut HSD and home heating. The government rejected it. Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier tell the people of Ontario the truth? Members will please take their seats. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary comment at the end of her question. Respond. Back to the member of Kanata Carleton. When I was out there door knocking, and, and granted, I congratulate you, you won by 600 votes in a by election, and God bless her. I didn't hear her ever say when she was door knocking, the carbon tax is good. Never heard that once. But I will do you a favor. I will call your riding right across the board and say you believe in the carbon tax. You believe in the 15 cents additional on, on a litre of gas. You believe that the, the clothes that these students are wearing have gone up because of the carbon tax. The food they're eating is because of the carbon tax. Everything that moves is based on the carbon tax. It is killing this country, it's killing this province, it's making it unaffordable. And that's the reason why every single Premier two weeks ago agreed to kill the carbon tax. members to make their comments through the chair. And, and I'll remind the independent members not to shout down the minister who's trying to answer the question that's been posed. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The supplementary question. Speaker. We put forward an amendment to Motion 70 to cut HST on home heating fuel, and the government rejected it. They will take endless hours to point fingers at other levels of government when they actually have tools to help the people of Ontario today. With, we know why won't this government do what is within their power to actually improve affordability for the people of Ontario. And to reply, Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, it's, it's unbelievable what we're hearing this morning uh, from the Liberal Party of Ontario. Uh, the Liberal Party of Ontario, at every opportunity, has voted in support of a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, uh, a provincial carbon tax and a federal carbon tax that the Parliamentary Budget Officer has said is costing families in Ontario and Canada more. The Bank of Canada! The Bank of Canada. It's unbelievable. It's a comedy show over here from the Liberals today, Mr. Order. Speaker, especially the front order. bench. It's like the Muppet Show with Stadler and Waldorf over here. It is unbelievable that they are trying to fool the people order. of Ontario into believing that they want to see the carbon tax reduced when at every opportunity they voted for it to go higher. It's on its way from 14 cents a litre on gasoline to almost 38 cents Response. a litre on gasoline by the end of the month. It's costing every Ontarian more now than before, and it's only going to get worse. Order. The next question, the member for Chatham-Kent-Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. In, in Northern Ontario, Temperatures dropped to negative 30 in the wintertime. I know, I've worked in some of our, our most northernmost communities. Unfortunately, many people in our rural, remote, and northern communities are limited in their options when it comes to home heating. It's unfair that this regressive carbon tax should punish them for the fuel they need to survive. Sadly, because of the actions taken by the federal Liberal government, we've seen how this carbon tax is creating two classes of Canadians, those who pay the carbon tax and those who don't have to. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact of the carbon tax on the people of our rural, northern, and remote communities? Mr. of Energy. Speaker, uh, there's a common sense member right there from down in southwestern Ontario asking a question because he understands how much the carbon tax is hurting people across Ontario, where the Ontario Liberal member moments ago just said to this House that the carbon tax is good for the people of Ontario. It's good for the people of Ontario, and they're making money because of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely ludicrous. We all know, we all know that the carbon tax is hurting the people of Canada. And that's why the federal government, that's why the federal government has adjusted their position on the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Talk to any farmer in this province. Talk to the people in Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, if these shrinking liberals over here, and they're down to what, nine now, if they keep up this ki kind of talk, they're not gonna have party status in the legislature anymore. Response. They're not even gonna have a party in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. It's time for Liberals across the country to wake up. Yeah. Order. Once again, I'm going to ask the independent members to come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Minister for your work and for that answer. Over the last few weeks, it's been very disappointing to see that even as we fight to make life more affordable, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP still support the carbon tax. While the opposition members have no problem supporting this harmful tax, the additional financial burden it places on our farmers is unacceptable. The reality is the federal carbon tax is producing disastrous results that are hurting our farmers and our consumers across the province. Unfortunately, our province's farmers are encountering soaring energy costs because of this very regressive and harmful tax. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the effects of the carbon tax it has on our agricultural sector. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, thank you to the member from uh, down in southwestern Ontario for the work uh, that he's doing to ensure that life is more affordable uh, for the people of Ontario. The same cannot be said about the Ontario Liberal Caucus and the Federal Liberal Caucus, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're urging the Federal Liberals to do what they did in Atlantic Canada and remove the carbon tax from home heating for residents of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and residents right across the country. The specific question was about farming and the effect on agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, the price of carbon is increasing the cost of diesel for the tractors. It's increasing the cost of gasoline for the trucks that take the products to the grocery stores and the processing facilities, Mr. Speaker. It's increased the cost for the grain dryers, Mr. Speaker, and the propane and gas that's used in that process. Mr. Speaker, it's driving up the cost of everything, but these Ontario— Order. Order. The minister will take his seat. 
The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. In my riding of Waterloo, a 66-year-old constituent received the letter that it was time for her mammogram appointment by December 15th uh, through the Ontario uh, Breast Screening Program. She called Freeport Hospital. They could only offer her a, an appointment on June 7th. That's six months later, a six-month delay to access screening that this government has acknowledged in its own fall economic statement can save lives can mean less invasive treatment and better outcomes. The receptionist suggested that she call Cambridge and perhaps they could get her in. She's shopping around for a mammogram in Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Cambridge told her that they actually can't make these kind of an appointments for people who are already receiving mammograms at a different location, even if it's six months late. So I'm at, my question is to the Minister of Health. Can you please explain why Kitchener-Waterloo residents are not able to to access breast cancer prevention care in their own community. The member for Eglinton Lawrence and Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, I don't know the particulars of this particular case. I would be very happy to meet with the member afterwards and discuss uh, the issue and see if there's something that can be done to uh, make sure that this patient gets uh, breast cancer screening in a timely way and in a convenient place. Um, I have uh, no information about exactly why she couldn't get it in her community, uh, but as you know, we recently announced an expansion of breast cancer screening for self-referral for women 40 to 50. 50 years of age, uh, which is a huge uh, advancement in breast cancer screening, and we, we want to make sure that women are screened appropriately and get treatment when they need it. Supplementary, member for Waterloo again. Interesting answer because you need to resource these programs because the announcements actually don't do the work. It's the people in the system that do the work. Women aged 40 to 50 were always able to get mammograms with a referral. The real problem is that the existing sites are already booked months in advance. I'd, you can resource and, and address this delay. But so far, you've refused to do so. This government stresses the importance of early detection and prevention, while at the same time making no efforts to reduce our existing health care backlog. Uh, 11,000, we learned actually, 11,000 Ontarians have died while waiting for surgeries, MRIs, and CT scans in the past year. That is your record. This government is only growing that number by forcing women to wait for life-saving mammograms. Speaker, to the Minister of Health, to the Parliamentary Assistant, how will this government address the six-month wait list for mammograms that women are being forced to accept because people will pay with their lives if they don't get those services? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. The member opposite should know that the Ontario Breast Cancer Screening Program screens 700,000 uh, every year, um, and it's offered at 241 sites across the province. And this government doesn't make announcements without resourcing them, so we're going to make sure that people have the screens that they need. Position uh, to order. That is, that is what our announcement was about. We're going to make sure that people get screening when and where they need it, and that they can self-refer uh, when when they are worried about having a, having a breast cancer screen at the age of 40. And I think that was a huge and important announcement, welcomed by the community, and we're going to make sure that we protect women's health in Ontario. I'm going to ask the official opposition not to shout down the, the member who's responding to the question. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Since the implementation of the federal carbon tax, people of Ontario have been paying more every single day for food, for services, and for transportation. They've even been forced to pay for more, for, been forced to pay more for the fuel in their cars. The federal carbon tax makes life more expensive for millions of people in Ontario. Business owners in my riding of Essex have told me that Liberal politicians and NDP politicians who support the carbon tax are out of touch with reality. It's making it more costly to do business, and businesses have to pay that, transfer that cost onto their customers. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please explain 
the negative impact Question. that the federal carbon tax is having on people in Ontario. Oh, Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Essex for his outstanding work and for his continued advocacy. Mr. Speaker, we have been saying it from day one. The federal carbon tax is hurting Ontario's economy. It's only making it harder for businesses to keep their costs down and makes life more expensive for families. Mr. Speaker, we warned the government years ago. We knew add a tax to farmers growing their food, growing our food, or to truckers who deliver our food. It's no surprise the gro groceries, grocery prices will go up. Mr. Speaker, while Canadian families and business struggle with the rising cost of just inflation, now is not the time for another increase of the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, I urge the federal government do the right thing, support Ontario's families and businesses, and scrap your carbon Response. tax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. I thank the minister for that response. Mr. Speaker, every day the hardworking people in the trucking industry deliver the goods that we rely on. Whether it's keeping our hospitals equipped with supplies that are needed and keeping the shelves stocked in our grocery stores, our truckers are essential. High gas prices caused by the federal carbon tax are making it harder for truckers to do their job. The federal government has increased the carbon tax on gasoline so far five times, and they're planning on doing it seven more times in the next seven years. This is wrong, and it's unfair, and it's going to hurt hardworking families across Ontario and in Essex County. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please explain the impact that the federal carbon tax is having on Ontario's trucking industry. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the member from Essex is exactly correct. The carbon tax makes it harder for our truckers to deliver the goods we need. And don't just take my word for it, Mr. Speaker. According to the Ontario Trucking Association, on average, the carbon tax raises the cost of deliveries by approximately six percentage, Mr. Speaker. This is hurting small, mid-size, and large fleets alike. A small business owner with a five trucks is seeing between 75,000 to 100,000 in an extra cost associated with the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister said the purpose of carbon tax was to shift Canadians to other options. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to trucking, there is no other options. The Response. carbon tax doesn't reduce carbon emissions. Mr. Speaker, it only makes the cost of transporting goods, transporting uh, food more expensive. Mr. Speaker, let's work. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Due to a shortage of early childhood educators, the High Park YMCA in my riding is being forced to suspend its infant care program starting January. This has left many families scrambling for alternatives on very short notice. The staffing crisis in the childcare sector, driven by low wages, is a problem this government has been warned about for years. Now we're seeing exactly what we feared would happen. Desperately needed affordable childcare spaces closing. Speaker, families in Hyde Park want to know, what actions will the minister take to ensure that the infant program at Hyde Park YMCA can continue? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I think we both share an interest in expanding affordable child care in the province. And we also both know that after 15 years of Liberals, where child care rose by over 400 per cent, we left so many working parents behind. And I'm proud that under our Premier's leadership, we have cut child care fees by 50 per cent for families in Hyde Park and right across Ontario, with a commitment to build 86,000 more spaces. Now, today, I'm going to be joining the parliamentary assistant, the Minister of Women and Economic Opportunities, and others to announce another step forward to support the workforce, to shore up the critical ECs that make a difference in our schools, and to further respect them by increasing support to retain and recruit more of them. Because we're going to need more workers as we create more spaces and as we continue to cut fees for the people of this province. The supplementary question, the member for London Fanshawe. 
Speaker, across the province, we are hearing of closures of enrollment being limited because programs cannot retain qualified educators. Ontario is one of only four provinces that still has not introduced a salary scale as part of the $10 a day child care program. Without it, we will be in the same child care crisis we've endured for years. With with more program closures and more families scrambling. The minister talks about respecting child care workers. Child care workers need respect. We're absolutely correct. But they want to know when will this government finally address the root of this crisis and implement a salary scale that they've been asking for, starting at $30 an hour for registered RCEs and $25 an hour for all other child care workers in the sector so you can actually fill the spaces that you're building with workers and respect them with the wages they deserve. And again, to reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the concept of respect, we have to remind ourselves that New Democrats urged the government to sign a deal with the federal government that would have left 70,000 parents out of the deal because you didn't want to respect parents who had their kids in for-profit childcare. You we want to talk about respect. This is a party that systematically voted against reductions in child care fees Order. as we historically cut fees, saving families eight to twelve thousand dollars per year. Members opposite could point their fingers. They should look in the mirror, stand up for choice, stand up for the rights of parents to make the best decision for their kids, and stand with Ontario as we deliver Order. a better deal billions of dollars more in funding and, yes, more flexibility so that all parents could benefit from affordable child care in this yeah, province. Yeah. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to standing order.